All right, good afternoon. Glad everyone could make it for our second panel. Our last panel, we were looking um, a little bit at, at how to resource smallholder farmers to increase yields and productivity. Um, this panel is going to change a little bit to be looking at some of the other ecological factors related to agriculture, um, water, um, land, and resource access, um, and a couple other related questions. And so, Dr. Kristen Page from the biology department is going to be moderating the panel for us and introducing our speakers. Well, it's my pleasure to um, moderate this panel. I'm really excited to hear what our panelists um, have to tell us. Um, we're gonna kind of follow the same format as the um, panel before this, and that I'll introduce each panelist before they speak. And then after our, all four panelists have um, taught you what they would like to teach you, we'll come up to the table and um, take your questions. So first I'd like to introduce Laura Yoder. She's an assistant professor at Mary Lee Environmental Learning Center of Goshen College, Indiana, where she directs the place-based interdisciplinary sustainability S semester in residence. For 12 years, she has worked in Latin America and Southeast Asia with development from the community level in agriculture to the regional and national government levels in land and forest policy. She taught in field-based research training programs at state university universities in Papua and post-Tsunami Aka, Indonesia, and conducted research in the fledgling nation of Timor-Leste. She has taught undergraduates with exceptional environmental education programs in northwestern Thailand and Bhutan. Organizations with which she has worked include the Agricultural Mission Center, ECHO, Mennonite Central Committee, the International Sustainable Development Studies Institute, or ISDSI, in Thailand, the School for Field Studies, the University of Melbourne's Asia Institute. She holds a bachelor's in biology from Messiah College, a master's in international agriculture and rural development from Cornell University, and a PhD in forestry and environmental studies from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Yoder. Good afternoon. It's really good to be with all of you today. I'm very excited to talk about one of my favorite topics with you. Uh, learning about smallholder farmers' local seed systems. And um, this is the first time I've been to Wheaton College, and it's been wonderful to learn to know many of you uh, through the past just few hours together. Anything for the second slide? Third. There we are. Good, we'll figure it out here. This is how it works, trial and error. So we're talking about smallholder farms. And uh, what are we talking about exactly with, with this kind of group? The normal definition that's given is those farms that are under two hectares, or about five acres. And this is not an insignificant number of people in the world who are doing this. There are more than 500 million farms worldwide and more than two billion people, two billion people in the world depend on these small farms for food and livelihoods, for most of their food and their livelihoods. And they are particularly important in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and in Asia, where about 80% of the food is produced on small farms. In China, for example, 98% of the farms average less than one hectare, so about uh, two acres, just under two acres, 86% of the food in India is produced on farms of this scale. In Africa, very highly variable, often depending on the uh, colonial history of land holdings. And in South America, it's about 20% of the food that's produced on small farms. Today I'll be talking, in contrast to some of the talks we've had about Africa, I'll be focusing on Asia, which is where most of my work has been. And I would say that smallholder farmers in Asia have a unique and critical role in both production and conservation of agricultural biodiversity. So the situation in Asia is that most farmers would be farming very sloping, hilly land in the uplands, and they would be farming on the forest margins or on edges where they will have fields and forests right adjacent to each other. And these are sites of very high ecological biodiversity which is important for our topic today. Our speaker reminded us last night that uh, continuous monocropping is risky business in agriculture. 
as disease can set in. So biodiversity in agriculture is essential for sustainable, robust agricultural systems. And diversity in agriculture is part of a durable solution to hunger worldwide. You see a picture here. This is from ISDSI students harvesting upland rice in Thailand. And they're in a field in the front. But in the back, you can see there's a forest fallow. So that forest you see in the back was a field like the one in the front about 15 years ago. This is the kind of situation where these fields uh, would occur. And because you have so many small plots in these variable ecosystems and microclimates, you have a high diversity of crops that can grow there. The characteristics of the smallholder farms in Asia would be mostly non-mechanized and very labor-intensive work, as we've also talked about here. Almost without exception, people will use planting mixes and intercropping, and they're producing primarily for household consumption. Because of these conditions, they produce small volumes of diverse land races. And land races would be varieties of crops that would be uh, not worked on by professional plant breeding programs, but that they would be something produced and saved on farm. They would save their own planting seed and also their selecting seed by hand. So these practices enable people to cultivate and then to eat a wide variety, an extremely wide variety of crops. You see in the upper right, that's a crop called Job's Tears. This would be a grain crop that would be used widely throughout Asia. It's also used in jewelry. Probably many of you have necklaces or shirts with this sewn onto it. Um, and this would be one of the crops that people would be using in these very variable settings. Because people are saving their own planting seed and because they're selecting their seed by hand, they also have a scale of notice to their agricultural system, which is quite different than that which is uh, part of most mechanized systems. So their agricultural production systems inform, the, inform and affect the uh, products that they have available for them. These would be called sometimes minor crops. But um, I don't like that term too much because they're actually not minor in the lives of people who depend on them and use them and go to a great deal of effort to cultivate them and keep them around. So you'll be seeing a lot of different uh, crops here. And that's, um, we're not talking about the staple grain crops that have been subject of some of the other things, but these would be the other crops. Many non-cultivated, uh, and these native foods are often what sustain people in the hungry seasons that they still have. So if you were to go at planting time to a Sweden field or a slash and burn field, if you will, in northwestern Thailand, you would catch someone perhaps walking to their field and maybe they would open their bag of planting seeds and you could peek in and this is what you would see. This mix of all kinds of vegetables, beans, other kinds of things that would be in there. And incidentally, planting time is when courtship happens. So if someone asks you to go plant the field, you may go out together and you sing romantic songs to each other as you're planting. Uh, so just beware if you're invited for planting. Um, <clears throat> these could be, this, the seeds would then be taken by pinches and dropped either in holes made with dibble sticks, with pointed sticks, or broadcast, as we've talked about, uh, on top of burnt fields. An example from India here would be with an organization I visited that was seeking to rev revive biodiverse rain-fed agriculture. And this is an area where they were seeking to uh, produce crops that did not need irrigation. And I will talk about this more in the resource access panel after this. So if you're, if you're interested in that, this would be a community, in fact, a, a very wide area that has opted out of receiving food aid. And they have now gotten to the point where they are producing surplus and have an internal welfare system for their own villages. Let's take a look at the seeds. So they had 32 piles of different seeds there. And I asked, this is a lot of different crops. How do you plant where? What are the mixes? And you'll see here some of the mixes that they have. These, these uh, pinches of seeds, these groups of seeds, would be those in poor and dry soils. These would be grown on black soils. These would be for the first planting on red soil, or on black soil, or planted on red soil. So that the crop mixes, these intercrops, intercropped crop mixes, would be used on different kinds of circumstances. This agricultural biodiversity is such an important part of their nutritional and their food security, because they're able to produce proteins, starches, and even oil seeds. I want to um, talk about five aspects that we might study on village seeds. And later I'll actually just talk about the first two of them. I mention this because this is a wonderful thing for student projects. 
And if you uh, students of almost any discipline are interested in doing a research project, this can be a very tidy, neat project that produces useful outcomes for local people. So if you wanted to study village seed systems, one aspect would be studying species. What is it that people are growing and how does this change over time? Another would be to study the sources and the supply. So what are the trade and regional exchange systems? How do people get the seed? A lot of this has to do with the information exchange that we also have talked about in the previous panel. So how does information move? How do seeds move? Uh, what are the patterns? What are the bottlenecks? Thirdly, you could study seed quality. What about germination? Vigor of plants that do germinate? And how, how long can seeds live? If people give up farming for a couple of years, will their seeds still be alive? This is a big and growing problem in many of the places where I've worked. People abandon farming for wage labor for just a year or two or three, and then they cannot recover the seeds that they previously were using, in marginal conditions especially. The fourth aspect would be on seed handling. So uh, how do they select seeds? How do they process them? And the all-important question of storage, as was just discussed earlier, so that uh, we aren't losing a large proportion of the food just because of weevils or rats or other things like that. Fifth area would be on improvement, and I believe we'll hear quite a bit more about that. Uh, what are the roles of farmer selection, plant breeding, on-farm selection? And in all of these areas, we would be seeking to discern local priorities, and also what is the potential for improvement? How much wiggle room is there? What is the low-hanging fruit? So what are the areas that people can work on where there's progress to be made? The picture here is of the Echo Seed Bank in northwestern Thailand. It's at an indigenous organization, and uh, they are collecting and then disseminating different varieties of food crops that are grown and highly valued in that area. Exceptional things, like a yard-long bean this big that you can actually bend in a circle and it doesn't break. Um, that was one of the exciting finds that someone brought to the seed bank. So I would like to talk about a research project that I was involved with for a year in 2010. And two areas that I'll focus on here are about indigenous vegetable seed practices. So how does that work? And then also the informal seed systems. How do people exchange seed? How do people get seeds? This, these were areas that are well known for other parts of the world. There's an awful lot of information known about this, for example, for maize in Mexico or beans in much of sub-Saharan Africa. But for vegetables in Asia, there was very little uh, literature published on this before. So this became the subject of a collaborative research program. There were research partners including ECHO and Penn State University, a Thai University in Chiang Mai. Uh, other organizations as well contributed staff. So this uh, was going on, and we decided to focus on work in Southeast Asia, specifically with vegetables. We were working with seven ethno-linguistic groups who have very low literacy in the villages, and because of this, we decided that the most appropriate research method that we would have to learn about these seed systems was to use visual methods. This was most appropriate to our audience and our context. So many of you would be familiar with this. We were using uh, village-based participatory action research on informal seed systems, specifically for the indigenous vegetables. You can see in this picture a few of the ways that we learned about that in practice. Uh, in the upper right, you can see that there are picture cards. Because we were working with seven different ethno-linguistic groups, we had seven languages and very low literacy, so we uh, d decided not to use surveys or things that required a lot of words, so we went with these large picture cards. So we had pictures of vegetables that uh, people could refer to, and we were able to then, as a side, an unexpected side benefit, develop a glossary of names of local vegetables in each of these languages, and we would use these for card sorts. A second area that we worked with was doing household interviews in how people store their seed, looking in their kitchens, where are they? Stuck in the wall, above the fire, sometimes in the crook of a tree. So looking at where people store seeds. And then the most fun part, upper left picture, is that we would have seed swaps. So farmers would come together, bring their best and brightest seeds to share with others, to show off what they have, what they've developed, and uh, be able to exchange seeds with other farmers at that time. The first area that we were looking at was vegetable species. So what is it that people are growing? And in Asia, vegetables are uh, just tremendously variable. There's diversity of creation beyond our wildest imagination of what God has made for us to enjoy. 
And in one hour, those of us who were working on this project drew up a list of 210 vegetable species that we knew of off the top of our heads that are eaten in Southeast Asia, specifically in Thailand, 210. So just think for a moment, how many vegetable species might you have eaten in the past week? Yeah, anyone on two hands? <laughs> so 210 was simply uh, ridiculously unmanageable, so we had to whittle it down, and we got down to 80 of the most common vegetable species that we could. These are um, grouped then further into perennial and annual vegetables. Perennial vegetables would be those that are from trees, shrubs, or vines that you plant just once and harvest. So you'd be harvesting leaves or shoots or flowers off of those. And perennial vegetables, especially in the tropics, are just tremendously important for long-term food st stability and security because they can survive droughts, they can survive typhoons, and they can survive when annual crops uh, would not work. They also have the great advantage of you don't have to store the seeds for them, and you can also propagate them very quickly. So we uh, did go with 50 perennial and 30 annual vegetables. They're from 30 different plant families, so a very diverse group. And they included those that were semi-domesticated and those in the process of domestication. So this was a very interesting point of learning for us. You can see the woman in the upper right. She has a, a tray there with the seeds that she brought to the seed swap. And she also brought two species of plants that these uh, plant experts in Southeast Asia just did not know what they were. And we said, what is this? And uh, she explained that she has been, she knew these from the forest. She came from Burma, she knew these from the forest, and she has been bringing them out of the forest closer and closer to home, making selections year by year. And these are forest plants, wild plants, that are in the process of domestication. This is an ongoing process. She's turning them into domesticated food plants out of wild forest plants. So this is an ongoing process. And then you can see in the lower left, we have here a, be a meal of uh, rice and ferns, which would be a semi-cultivated, wild-harvested crop that you can eat daily in parts uh, of Southeast Asia. So these would be, those are semi-domesticated, they're kind of cultivated on a commons area, but people who need food can go and harvest them there. Not exactly a cultivated crop. And then in the bowl next to the ferns with the spoon is fig shoots, curried fig shoots. And these would be, they taste just like artichokes. And uh, they're available when hardly anything else is available. And uh, when other vegetables are not present, you can always reliably get fig shoots. So these were the species that we decided to work with. One of the things that we had to figure out is actually what is a vegetable? We think we might know that from our own context, but of course this is socially and culturally defined. So we invented our own definition for what is a vegetable. You will not find this in any dictionary other than the ECHO handbook to the project. Um, but it is any edible part of wild or cultivated plants, leaves, shoots, stem hearts, flowers, and fruits that is eaten as a significant portion of a primary dish, not including pulses or beans, not including carbohydrate-rich grains. So no rice, no corn, no sorghum no root crops, and no dessert fruits, which is a special class of food in Asia. But the real definition is whatever fits on this table. So you see here a picture of a, a low table about knee height that would normally be in the middle of a kitchen, and the food curried, uh, different curries and sauces would be put onto that table. So our basic definition for a vegetable was anything that would be a main ingredient in a dish that would go on the low table. Um, but we had to come up with this as well. The second area that we looked at was that of sources and of supply. So this is something uh, that I've had interest in for a long time. My master's work in Honduras many years ago looked at this issue for maize and bean seeds in the highlands of Honduras. So I was very, very curious. And this is something that's a bit of a black box in agricultural extension and in agricultural development in general for Asia. How do people get the seeds that they are planting? And getting village level data on this was something we were very, very eager to do. So I mentioned before, we had group interviews on this. And you see in the lower left, this was one of the card sort activities. So with men's groups and with women's groups, they would have their stack of 80 cards and they could sort them in various ways. The ones we know, the ones we don't. The ones we have, the ones we used to have but don't anymore, those we still have. So they could sort these cards in various ways and we could come to understand uh, what they have. They could also sort those that they save every year and those they have to borrow from someone else every year. 
So they would sort those in various ways. Then we also had, as you see in the other pictures, regional seed swaps. Farmers brought hundreds and hundreds of their most interesting, valuable, unique crops to show off and uh, to share the seeds with others. Some of the findings that we had from that are that um, trading small amounts of seed is very common. This is something that happens all the time. It's so mundane, people wondered why we're asking about it sometimes. Most farmers do produce most of their own seed. And one thing that was unanimous across everywhere that we did the research was that in no case was there payment or repayment of cash in, in cash or in kind for loaning of seeds. So for example, if I have pumpkin seeds and you need pumpkin seeds, uh, you can come and ask me and I will give them to you. And I do not expect repayment of pumpkin seeds or pumpkins. Same with other crops as well. Uh, this was, the, people were adamant about this. We kept asking, well, shouldn't they at least bring you one fruit? How about just a little bit of seed? Absolutely not. And this was something that is, I think, again, different from other parts of the world. But uh, in all the communities where we were asking, this was, uh, this was the norm. Trust networks and reciprocity are very important in people uh, conducting uh, seed trades. And inter-ethnic trading was very common. They also perceived that seed sharing can build relationships, that this is an important part of reciprocity and building relationships among different groups. One component that was interesting to me that was quite different from my earlier work in Latin America, where farmers save their maize seed, their corn seed from year to year, they will save on farm. But their bean seed, they never saved on farm. There was one man who produced all of the bean seeds for a seven village area. That was part of my master's work in Honduras. And I found that to be a very interesting contrast. Why the maize, why the beans? There's pollination reasons for that and others. So I kept looking for who are the seed keepers? Who are the bean seed, bean seed savers in this context? And we found, again, none. So um, either we were asking the wrong questions, or we didn't ask long enough, or they don't exist. So this is something that is done very much on farm and very diffuse. People also found that it was easier to ask for seeds, to borrow seeds across ethnic groups, from Karen to Aka or Lahu. It's easier to ask across ethnic groups than to ask someone with your own ethnicity but within different wealth classes. So it would be easier to ask a person of a different ethnicity or language group than it would be to ask someone wealth, with more wealth or less wealth than yourself. That was also uh, an interesting finding. And that poorer farmers ask more. They borrow seed more. That's, again, not unexpected. We also learned quite a bit about the availability of commercial seed, which is very newly available in these communities. Incredibly prestigious to have purchased a packet of seeds. Many people, as we were asking, could count the month and year that they had first ever patch purchased a packet of seeds. That, oh, in September of 2008, I bought a packet of Kankung seeds, or something like that. So this was something that people uh, found as a source of social pride. Most of these would be hybrids produced in government programs, and we treated these seeds as we did with the other seeds as sources of study. So we conducted germination tests on commercial seeds and found that they're widely variable, just as with farmer seeds. And uh, we were learning about these, of course, um, with the hybrid seeds, it was a learning curve for farmers that they shouldn't be saving these and expecting to get the same crops year after year. They cost about five to eight cents per packet. This is off the screen there, but this uh, should read gender roles in the informal seed system in Changdao and Chiang Rai, Thailand, and Sve Rieng in Cambodia. Um, you can't read all the small print here, but what I wanted to just show is uh, we had a very simple way of having people uh, give the gender distinctions in parts of the seed process. We had two cards. Everyone in the room had a card that, with a picture of a woman and a picture of a man. And when we said planting decisions, you could put one or the other or both. Easiest data collection we've ever done. Uh, and this was also some of the most surprising results that we had from this program. In fact, the Thai and different ethnic group uh, extension workers that we were working with were very surprised by this data. So that's, again, illustrating the importance of doing field research. It can surprise even those who work with it day after day. So of course, here we see very heavily uh, weighted toward female side, even in planting decisions, planting, selecting seeds, drying, and food preparation. So again, if you were to be designing an extension program, this would be a very simple kind of thing to ask in advance. 
And I will leave you here with some pictures of Thai eggplants. See those? And uh, gourds in the middle for storage. And there's a very interesting plant in the lower left. Does anyone know what that is? Coffee. Thank you. Yes, so that's coffee. And uh, when I was taking this picture, I learned that this hedge is valued for its shoots and its young leaves as a vegetable. Now, they commented that the terribly bitter seeds also produced by this plant are byproducts. But those seeds are left to drop to the ground as chicken food. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Stuart Dykstra. Uh, Mr. Dykstra is Senior Vice President and Principal Hydrogeologist at V3, a civil engineering, science, and construction firm based in Woodridge, Illinois. He has been with the firm for over 15 years and served as director of its natural resources and environmental service lines for much of that time. Throughout that time, Stuart continued to be project manager for complex multidisciplinary projects in both the public and private sector. Projects include groundwater, water supply, wetlands, fluvial geomorphology, flood control, and mining reclamation. In 2009, Stuart assumed the role of establishing V3 Canada Limited in Edmonton, Alberta, which is now a 15-person engineering office serving Western and Northern Canada. Since 2010, he has been fully engaged in developing V3's Haiti operations and expanding V3's water supply services in developing nations around the world. He has worked on projects in Haiti, Central African Republic, Kenya, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia, Uganda, and Peru. He travels extensively for project work. Recently, Stuart co-founded Water Technologies International, LLC, which is a company developing remote monitors for water supplies in developing nations. Um, welcome to the platform. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, water supply specifically for irrigation. So I'm going to be, this, this talk is, is um, for irrigation only in uh, uh, um, developing nations. Um, many of the principles apply also to uh, drinking water supplies. But there's also some differences, and um, you know that's for another topic some other time. Um, th three types of really irrigation that, that we see in the developing uh, world, uh, and that is diversion, diversion of stream flow and so forth, uh, groundwater um, in a large water use uh, context, and then uh, low water use uh, context like uh, drip irrigation and so forth. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about diversion uh, because actually we don't see it a whole lot in areas where um, the, we, we see it more in areas where the countries are better developed and where there are systems of management and so forth that um, control, control it. But I do have one example where I worked on recently was down in Peru on the Arequipa Plain. And um, we, we wanted to talk a little bit about the ecological issues with um, irrigation. And um, with this one, what we have is a number of large diversion ditches coming off of several major streams um, that then uh, uh, irrigate uh, valley bottoms in very, very arid regions. Um, the problem that we come into with the diversion uh, areas, in, the, in this area at least, and there's, of course, all, a whole catalog of issues that can arise, but with, with um, this example was that the irrigation flows really alter the stream quality. Uh, the stream comes in at 300 parts per million um, at the top uh, of the plain, so to speak, and by the time it gets out to the ocean, it's, it's over 6,000 parts per million of uh, dissolved solids. And so that's just one of the issues. Um, obviously, there's plenty of issues with dams, fish, fish passage uh, interruption, and so forth with diversion. Uh, but um, ecologically, um, you know, that's one of the areas that we saw uh, that was very significant with, with this problem. The other thing is you can see um, down, basically, it's kind of a little hard to see with light. We have an irrigated valley here, but we also, they did irrigate up on the top of the valleys, and what that's causing is, is slope failure, because essentially we're creating um, uh, seepage down onto the steep slopes that, that uh, line the valleys, and we're losing a lot of the side slopes into the valley, and um, causing um, some major environmental issues associated with that, including uh, 
uh, real bad sediment yields and so forth. Like I said, um, diversion is really not, not that much of the topic today, so I wanted to move on to um, what I work on in mostly, and that's in, uh, down in Haiti. I work full time down there now, um, and about 20% of our work, or maybe a little more, 30, 40% of our work is, is irrigation. It varies from time to time. Just a little background, uh, Haiti is considered the most water poor nation in the world. Um, that is not because it's lacking water. It's lacking access to water, and, it's, and, and oftentimes, uh, to further qualify it, it's lacking access to clean water. Uh, Haiti actually would fall somewhere, if you looked at uh, water management issues, Haiti would probably fall somewhere in here in terms of uh, the availability of water over time. Um, but because of management issues and because of, of um, poor control, um, Haiti is, is by far the, the most water poor nation in the world. Um, what are the issues? Um, sometimes it's not available. Uh, that kind of counter, counters to what I was just saying, but there are regions where it's very, it's very scarce. But the issues are actually more commonly, it's unreliable, it's of poor quality, um, and it's missing the, the supporting infrastructure for delivery and reten retention. The other issue with Haiti is that there is, um, besides the, the pit toilet and so forth, uh, just until um, about three months ago, there were no uh, formal sanitation facilities at all anywhere in the country. And so that causes a lot of issues, obviously. One of the systems that I work on quite a bit uh, in the area when it comes to irrigation again, remember I'm distinguishing this from uh, drinking water supply, are the large internationally funded systems that were developed um, over time uh, to basically exploit a resource that is very plentiful and, um, and available for, for exploita exploitation. Um, unfortunately, things don't always go as planned. Um, the system we have here is out in the Gonaives uh, Plain, uh, uh, near the, uh, basically near the uh, termination of the Artibonite. Uh, you can see it basically up in the northwest area of, of Haiti. Uh, we've got about 40 or so, 36 to, uh, or so uh, uh, wells out in the area. They're very large, they're large diameter 15 inch wells and that they produce somewhere between 700 and 2,500 gallons uh, per minute. Uh, it was built by the Germans. It's an absolutely beautiful system in terms of its design, its engineering, and so forth. And it, it definitely exploits a resource that is very plentiful in that area uh, once you have access to it. Um, it uh, that area of Haiti, more right through here, produces about 40% of the food production for Haiti. The good part about what's happening there is that uh, uh, the system is slowly being re rehabilitated. Uh, we're putting in new pumps. Uh, we're relining wells. Uh, what's interesting about this is the wells were made out of plywood. And that plywood uh, now is uh, uh, 40 years old or so, and it's starting to fail. And once it fails, that well is gone. And once that well is gone, it will never will be replaced. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're relining it with PVC. Uh, we're putting in uh, good pumps and new electrical and so forth. Um, but um, there's a lot more bad to the story than good. Um, the system is highly underutilized. And uh, in fact, I'm not sure a single well is working right now um, for reasons I'll talk in a minute. Um, the other thing is it, it's really not an appropriate system for the area. Um, uh, the environment supports it, but uh, it costs very much to produce the power to run the, the pumps. There's no uh, maintenance, um, really, of the system uh, that's credible. And um, really, that's a problem throughout Haiti and throughout a lot of developing nations, is that you're working with subsistence cultures and they just do not plan maintenance. And you've got a very sophisticated like I said, a beautifully engineered and constructed system, but it's not maintained. Uh, the bad is, here's some examples. Um, one, of the, one reason none of the pumps are working, even though we put in brand new pumps, is that the power system is completely um, uh, stolen 
And you can see, uh, again, it's a little dark, but you can see over here the, um, all of the ways that people are essentially taking power off of single limbs of the three-phase system. Well, what happens is, since the three-phase system is, is horizontal, they all take it off of one leg, and we've got a 50% balance, imbalance between the legs on the power system, burns up the pumps just like that, and we lose $100,000 worth of work. And then the ugly is um, it just, you know, we have beautiful assets there that are just lying waste. And uh, for instance, that's a $5,000 meter right there. Uh, that's at least a $50,000 well. That, you know, it, it, goes to, it, it goes without say, saying. Another system we look at that's probably more context appropriate for a developing nation are things like the small, innovatively, uh, innovative, internationally funded systems. Uh, particularly drip irrigation is very uh, water efficient, prevents drought, uh, crop failure, and it increases yield, and it's simple to, to employ. Some of the setbacks, though, with that are that um, uh, it's expensive. It's expensive not in its own sense, but it's, it's expensive because uh, the increased yields that would help pay for a system like that can't be exploited. You can't bring the, the materials to market. The waste, the storage issues we talked about earlier, the roads, all of those things are basically inhibitors for uh, the farmers actually getting the benefit for the increased um, yield that they get off of it. The other thing is uh, food aid. In Haiti, it's the land of 10,000 NGOs, and they have destroyed the agricultural um, economy there. Um, I've been in markets where there is food in, in just brimming at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and someone is a mile out of, or a kilometer out of town giving away food for free. And it, it, um, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, be producing food in the U.S. if, if we had our um, economies destroyed by that. And Haiti, um, Haiti's economy is destroyed from that, their, their agricultural economy. Um, the last one area is uh, well-meaning volunteer um, uh, construction of water systems, irrigation in particular. Um, it, it's with, a, with so many NGOs and so forth, um, Haiti is an area that receives the benefit of a lot of goodwill. And um, it, that's a very, I mean, you, you understand the, the mechanism, it's a Christian mechanism that, not mechanism, a Christian motivation that brings that to, to Haiti. Unfortunately, what happens is um, um, there's a wide variety of the quality of that kind of work. Uh, we do see a lot of good work, and we actually exploit that. We work with a lot of, a lot of NGOs and so forth. Uh, when I say exploit it, but I mean is we, for the good of the, the area that we're working on and so forth, we do partner up with volunteer efforts. Unfortunately, you get the other side of the, the spectrum. Uh, for instance, what I'm looking at here, these people standing around here, uh, they, that's, a, dug, that's a, a well that they uh, uh, installed um, about 100, me, uh, 100 feet deep, 35 meters or so actually. And uh, if you turned around where I was standing and looked behind me, the ocean was, um, oh, I don't know, from here to the science building, I guess. And so what they did, the thing is, this thing was such an exciting well for us to see because I had no anticipation we'd ever see a system like this. But uh, we hit, or they hit salt water going all the way down until they hit a freshwater zone, and then it came up artesian. Artesian meaning under its own pressure, it started to flow. And so what you have out in that uh, plain, that saltwater plain, is you have this beautiful aquifer underground that, that someday can be exploited um, appropriately, sustainably. Um, and what they've done is they've opened it up to every hurricane flow and everything else. Th this will have um, uh, four to five meters of water on it um, during some um, extreme flow events. And it will drive the salt water and the seawater right back into the aquifer. 
and it, they, they will ruin that aquifer. And uh, it was because they don't know what they're doing. You know, it's good intentions gone wrong. The other system here um, was the spring cap system, which um, they apparently just constructed by putting pipes coming out of the wall right in the middle of a flow zone. Um, and um, no surprise there, it, it, it failed within a couple of months when a hurricane went through. Um, the unintended consequences, poor construction, or rapid failure, poor engineering, um, and so forth. So um, the, the, the lesson from this is that a lot of times, in all of these systems I'm talking about, the failure isn't technological, actually. Uh, it is actually management. Um, one of the NGOs we worked with down there had, had a great uh, quote. He said, never, we never fail to try to implement a technological solution for a management problem. And, and that is so, so very true. Um, because uh, a lot of times when we go in there and we think we know better and we, we think we know how to do something, what we do is we, we start seeing unintended consequences. We empower the local strongman uh, we ruin their markets, we create natural resource damage, and in the end, 50% of the wells are still broken, billions of dollars are wasted, not in Haiti, but I mean around the world, and people still act, uh, lack clean water, and people still die from that um, in, in very large amounts. So the solution. Um, there's no doubt, good engineering, good science, um, and, and volunteerism has a, has a very important role in providing uh, water systems and water access to water. And in, in the case we're talking about today is irrigation water. But the most important thing, and there, unless you have this, every system will fail, including that German system, uh, which is you've got to have local ownership, you have to have the locals, Locals can be either the community or it can be the, the, the national government, but you have uh, someone responsible for that system and a business plan essentially that, that creates reinvestment in that system for maintenance. You create, you do this through either community organization or through the, the support of building government, government institutions. And there's a role to be played and sometimes that role is over 20 years, 30 years of building civil society, essentially. But without, if you just provide a technological solution to, to the water issue, and you don't try to build civil society alongside of it, you will have failure. Um, you also have other ramifications towards, towards the, 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 the culture of the community as well. And I think pride and independence is, is something when they do control their systems that does build that. This last is um, just for illustration. Um, it is the kind, it's, I'm not gonna go through it, but it's essentially, it's it just to show that it's a very simple flow chart in terms of what is it that the organization that needs to be created. And it's, it's really essentially uh, creating a, a, a group of people responsible for the system and with, with the ability or with the support to essentially collect fees and so forth that they can reinvest back in the system. Thank you. Our next presenter is Stan Dorr, who completed a Master of Science degree from the University of Texas Pan Am campus, then moved to Swaziland to begin a 22-year career in international community development and education, mostly in Africa. From Swaziland, where Stan worked as a high school science teacher, he moved to South Africa, where he worked at first in education and later in nature conservation. In 1990, Stan moved to Malawi for four years, working with a Christian vocational school as a director. In 1994, Mr. Dorr began working with a private family foundation, training in agriculture, as well as program design and management, which over a five-year period took him and his wife, Beth, to 23 countries in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America. In 2000, Beth and Stan were recruited to join World Vision and moved to Mauritiana, West Africa, where Stan was a program director and Beth was a national agriculture coordinator. In 2004, Stan was recruited by ECHO to begin the process of a leadership change, which would give Martin Price, founding CEO, <clears throat> the opportunity to retire. After serving two years as the deputy director of ECHO in June of 2006, Stan was unanimously elected by the ECHO board as the president and CEO of ECHO. <coughs> Excuse me. 
During the six and a half years that Stanton has led ECHO, the organization has grown internationally to having ECHO offices in Thailand, Tanzania, and South Africa. ECHO is currently working with organizations and individuals in 177 countries, providing tropical agricultural technical support and training along with seeds for tropical plants and networking opportunities. Thanks for coming today, Stan. Well, I'm not going to take it personally that everybody left just before I came up to speak. Um, I'll quietly cry myself to sleep later on tonight. Um, but I do know that it's probably the time it, and um, had nothing to do, at least that's what I'm telling myself, it had nothing to do with my being here. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a rich and exciting adventure for me to be a part of this. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for Paul and the invitation that I've had to be able to be a part of this today and, and yesterday's event. Um, at ECHO, we talk a lot about small-scale agriculture. And for me, it's very personal. I've often been asked why, why I get so excited about small-scale agriculture. And I guess for me, it's because I've lived most of my life in Africa, and I've seen the consequences of the hunger season, as was spoken about yesterday. They've taken what's left of their crop and they've used it for seed. The rains have come and with the rains have come mosquitoes and malaria. And at a time when their nutritional systems are so vulnerable, disease hits and it's when people die. We've heard some of the statistics and often statistics become an excuse for not putting a face on poverty. The numbers are huge. But the latest FAO statistics show that there are over 500 million small-scale farmers in the world. Or there's over 500 million farmers in the world. 80% are considered small-scale farmers. 40% of those small-scale farmers are women. We often define small-scale farmers as the piece of land that they have to work on. But there's other characteristics that small-scale farmers share. Often they have minimal, if any, formal education. They are resistant to try new techniques as a survival coping mechanism. And that's one of the things that I take the most serious at ECHO when we, when we suggest something for somebody to try. I recognize that here in America, when the drought hit in Iowa and 70% of the maize crop or corn crop in Iowa was lost this last year, there's probably not a lot of Iowa farmers that are going to starve to death. There's safety nets built into this system here in America. But I also know that in Africa, if somebody tries something new and it doesn't work, somebody dies. A mother has to make a decision saying, I'll feed this child and this child, but I won't feed this child because I can't feed all of them, and that one's going to die. And that's the face of poverty. And that decision is being made by mothers every day. Every day. So this resistant to new techniques isn't because they're stubborn. It's because they're there today because their father used those agricultural techniques and they survived. And his father used those techniques and he survived. And to try something new as a level of risk that is almost unimaginable. Another characteristic of small-scale farmers is that they have very little, if any, access to capital. Many of the systems that we're hearing about is, are, are fairly capital-intensive systems that we, we talk about with fertilizer and equipment and, and hybrid seeds. 
And those systems often, when they do bring in loan schemes, they can have disastrous consequences. I know of a loan scheme that was put in place in India designed to loan money to the farmers so they could buy fertilizer and hybrid seeds. The farmers planted their crop. It was coming up beautifully. And the elephants came in from the forests and destroyed it. Well, the seed company, the fertilizer company, still wanted their money. And as a result, the farmer sold his land and two of his children into slavery to pay back the loan for fertilizer and seed. So you no longer have a small-scale farmer. He is landless, and two of his children are now cracking rocks in a quarry to pay off that debt. They often faced labor constraints. When I first moved to Africa in 81, that was always the big deal. We could, you could do anything labor intensive. Buy a tractor? Why? You got 10,000 people that are unemployed. And you can hire them to, to plow your field or hoe your field for a thousandth of what it costs just for the fuel for the tractor. That is no longer the case. And often labor is a is a limiting factor in many of the labor-intensive systems that small-scale farmers face. The other aspect of characterizing many small-scale farmers, and we've heard it over and over again in the last 24 hours, is they live very close to survival. A publication that came out in the 1930s in the United States, published by the US Department of Agriculture, and still in print, interestingly enough, made one of the most fascinating statements that I've ever heard about agriculture. Desperation trumps education every time. Desperation trumps education every time. My wife, who is the real brains in my family and, and the agriculturalist, as you heard in the uh, introduction, she was talking to a Haitian farmer and he made the statement, I know, I, am, I know this is leading to destruction because I am causing this destruction by my own hand. But when you're desperate, you can't think of tomorrow. All you can think of is today. And these are the constraints that many small-scale farmers are facing. The other thing that we've been hearing over and over again is that the majority of small-scale farmers in the world are net consumers, not net producers. You see, when the maize prices go up and you're a producer and you're getting a great crop, what does that mean? That means you're making a whole lot more money from the work that you put into this system. But if you're a net consumer, what does it mean? You're paying more money to feed your family. In 2006, before the food crisis of 2008, it was estimated that people in Tanzania spend as much as 77% of their income just to feed their families. By the late, in 2008, estimations were out of Bangladesh that 96% of people's income was going just to feed their family. 96%. Doesn't leave a whole lot of room for medical expenses, school fees, shoes. Many of the current solutions being used or tried to increase production by small-scale farmers, and I know this is controversial, but I was told by Howard Buff or Warren Buffett's son that Warren Buffett's statement is, if you haven't insulted everybody in the room after your speech, you haven't given a good speech. And it's not my intention to insult anyone. But most of the current solutions being used to increase small-scale farmers like um, production are highly unlikely to succeed. I don't know how many times I've spoken to NGOs, oh yeah, we have an ag program. Tell me about it. Oh, we provide seeds and fertilizer and hose. You know, folks, 
If that would have solved the problem, there wouldn't be a lot of hungry people around. Often these, these inputs to increase production for small-scale farmers are based on highly subsidized inputs from either governments or NGOs and are often unsustainable. If you get a chance to look at the African Renewal, which is a, a publication, the January 13th or January 2013 copy of African Renewal, you'll see a story on there about Malawi. Malawi has been hailed as, as one of the great success stories because of the subsidies that, that the Malawi government put into to, um, fertilizer. And the article is just basically saying it's not as much of a success story as people thought. Now, I have some issues with that article because I used to live in Malawi and I saw how much hunger was taking place there and I see now that as they're backing off of their subsidies, Malawi is still exporting grain. And I would like to think that's because they're increasingly selling more grain. Although when I lived there, you couldn't buy sugar in Malawi, even though it produced lots and lots of sugar, because it was all slipping across the border into Mozambique. And I could buy Malawi sugar in Mozambique, but I couldn't buy it in Malawi. So I'm not sure what the issues are there. Often, small-scale farmers are asked to use historic farming techniques on what are becoming smaller and smaller pieces of land that are becoming less and less productive. Often we have systems that are being promoted that require high capital or high technology inputs. And uh, this is where we differ with the AGRA program, the new Green Revolution program that's being promoted by the Gates Foundation and Rockefeller Foundations. And there's several issues we have with that. Not that those things are intrinsically wrong, but they're not a silver bullet. We also see that projects developed by many NGOs too often define sustainability from the perspective of sustainability of the NGO, not sustainability of the community. We have a major donor and we were discussing return on investment for donors and, and uh, sustainability and he says, well, I know how to define sustainability. I thought, oh, great, finally I'm gonna get a decent, because everybody uses the word and almost nobody knows what it means. In, in my world that I live in. And he says, we define sustainability as the donor got tired of paying for it, so we're calling it sustainable. Now, for those of you who didn't get that, you will. Um, and so we, we, we look at people defining sustainability as what kind of project can I do? How can I write the report in a way that makes the donor interested in giving me another project? And it's all supposed to be for the community. But so often the community really doesn't have any long-term benefits coming out of these things. To effectively address increased production in small-scale farmers, solution must address the constraints that small-scale farmers face, as we discussed above. With a focus on change agents, those individuals in the community that are willing to learn something, try something new, creating an environment for them to be able to do low risk or no risk experimentation. And those individuals are the ones that are willing to share that with their neighbors. Now, for our culture here in the West, we often find this a very confusing thing. One of the greatest insights that came for me was our Chief Operations Officer, Tim Albright at ECHO, he was raised in Mali and, uh, and then spent 23 years working in Burkina Faso. So he is probably more African, well, he's definitely more African than he is American, but understands the bridge between the two cultures. And he said one of the things that he was taught by one of his African mentors was, you in the West, you're very tight with your resources, but very generous with your knowledge. He says it's just the opposite here. We are very generous with our resources, but we are very tight with our knowledge. 
And we often call, say in a, in a positive way, knowledge is power. Well, it is. And that's why often you don't give it up. And so you need to look for those people in the community that can do that. The most successful of these techniques we've found has been building soils and the ecology of the soil. And it's what we now call the Brown Revolution. It's a counter to the statements about reinventing the Green Revolution, which, whereas it did produce lots of food, and the predictions of Ehrlich back in 1968 that there would be mass starvation in the 70s and 80s didn't come true in much Credit needs to go to Norman Borlaug and his work. But there have been downsides to that. And studies coming out of, the, out of Iowa State University have shown that you can get actually as much production and as much profitability using a four crop rotation of maize, sor corn, sorghum, wheat, and alfalfa in an organic system as you get in your normal maize, corn, rotation systems here in America, which have massive amounts of, of pesticides and herbicides going into them, with a 200-fold less chemical inputs. And it can come even as far as economic return on a normal year and up to 32% higher yield with the organic system than you get from the other system during the drought year. So as we work as an organization, ECHO has been working and the research that we're doing in South Africa is really based on building soil ecology in a way that can significantly increase the potential of the soil to continue to feed the population instead of continually taking from it. And we're finding that this is so effective as you work with conservation techniques and then adding conservation techniques, conservation agriculture techniques, to intercropping and using cover crops. Our research in South Africa is showing that we are actually getting literally hundreds of kilos of nitrogen put back into the soil just from of, of leguminous cover crops. Ways in which we can build the capacity of the small-scale farmer to produce more food in a way that he can afford, that he can implement, and that leaves the land in better condition after he's brought back his harvest than before he put in his crop. Thank you very much. The final speaker in our panel today um, is Gabiza Ejeta. Um, Dr. Ejeta was born and raised in a small rural community in West Central Ethiopia. He completed his early education in his native country, including a Bachelor of Science in Plant Sciences from Alameya College in 1973. He attended graduate school at Purdue University, earning his master's and PhD in plant breeding and genetics. In 1979, um, Gabiza joined the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics and con conducted seminal sorghum research in Sudan for five years. In January of 1984, Dr. Ejeta returned to Purdue as an assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy. Since then, he has led a comprehensive educational and research program at Purdue with emphasis on African agricultural research and development. He currently holds a position of Distinguished Professor of Plant Breeding and Genetics in International Agriculture at Purdue University. Professor Ejeta has served on numerous science and program review panels, technical committees, and advisory boards of major research and development organizations, including the International Agricultural Research Centers, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and a number of national and regional organizations in Africa. He was a member of the team that launched the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, a joint effort of the Rockefeller and Gates Foundation. Dr. Ejeta has served the, cons uh, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, the largest publicly funded agricultural research consortium in the world, as a member of its Science Council, and currently as a member of its consortium board. He is also a m board member of the Sasakawa Africa Program. Dr. Ejeta was recently de designated Special Advisor to USAID Administrator um, Dr. Rajiv Shah. Dr. Ejeta is a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a Fellow of the Crop Science Society of America, and a Fellow of the American Society of Agronomy. Among his many awards, Gabiza Ejeta was the recipient of the 2009 World Food Prize and a National Medal of Honor from the President of Ethiopia. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Ejeta. I don't have anything to add after all those presentations. We can start with uh, 
of the Q&A. Uh, I will be saying my thank you a little later on, but uh, it's been a great privilege to be here. Uh, I commend what you do uh, to have the cause of the poor on a regular basis in your minds and to introduce the young men and women that you work with here to continually uh, put the thoughts of uh, the needy in developing countries uh, for that and the dividends that that would pay in years to come and which you already have come as evidence of many professionals that are actually coming here after years of uh, working somewhere else. And it, it's just a, a great, great program. I, I, from the little that I know, I'm an extremely impressed. All right, I'll quickly go through my slides. Uh, as I said, I don't have much to add. And so we could either dismiss it or uh, say this is a capstone of what I've been discussed. Um, it, it's my judgment, and, and I think many agree with me, uh, maybe some of you as well, that uh, food security has truly become the foremost challenge of humanity in this 21st century, uh, catalyzed by population growth and the uh, increasing demand for food feed um, and fuel now that is coming up, and the emergence of a variety of challenges. I think I would be discussing those challenges uh, tonight, um, uh, many of which have been discussed. Uh, water, uh, probably um, the most critical challenge that we're facing in agriculture, has been thoroughly discussed uh, this afternoon. Um, so the issue is, um, in, a, in an attempt to produce enough food for a growing world population, and the kind of discussion that uh, Roger had yesterday. And the issue then is, at what cost? Will we be able to sustainably feed a growing world population you know, 40, 50 years from now and uh, for times to come? And, and that's where it really requires some thought in terms of making adjustments. And so I think humanity is seriously challenged uh, by this assignment that we're given. Um, and as Roger indicated yesterday and again today, I really believe and agree with him as well that um, if opportunities are provided, smallholder farmers of the world join in to feed themselves and feed the world and take care of the land and the natural resources, I think that our world would be a better place. It is clear to me that smallholder farmers have done the best they can with what they have. Um, to enter the global economy, they're gonna need a lot of help. And I think some of the issues that we would be talking about tonight would be along that. I don't know how many of you have put yourself uh, thinking now, as you visit many of these places, let alone you, even myself, who were born and raised in the continent, I'm not sure, even with what I know, having the benefit of education, how well I would cope with the limited means that smallholder farmers in Africa have. And, and the challenge that they're faced is not small, is what I'm trying to say. In the past, the smallholder holder farmers have mostly been left alone to fend for themselves, and the responsibility that now we talk about what their role is in society over time is really an accidental, because every family is supposed to produce their own food, and with the diversity of species and so on that we heard this afternoon, African farmers were no different, and I think smallholder farmers everywhere had been doing that. But when land is divided into many pieces, generation after generation of families, and the population growth, the pressure from the economy is there, the opportunity these smallholder farmers have to contribute to the sustainability of the land and natural resources gets very limited. So their immense value to society is not fully acknowledged. By that I mean, I don't think as a system, society acknowledges the importance, the important role 
you know, smallholder farmers play in sustaining communities in many of these nations and contributing to um, the civilization there. Historical and institutional infrastructure that smallholder farmers continue to operate under is not compatible with the entrepreneurial aspiration that these smallholder farmers have uh, to broaden um, their lifestyle. Small-scale farmers can compute and they know what is good for them. Um, but as you've heard over and over again, they've been burned far too many times and therefore they have risk aversion. And so the primary obligation for every family then is really how to feed the family. You know, we get up, we have a lot of, our, a lot of thoughts, we could think about a number of issues. But for smallholder farmers, and, and I'm, if, if, if there is anything that gives me authority to speak about smallholder farmers, is all members of my family, even today, are smallholder farmers. Unfortunately, many did not get education. And so for these people, the thing they think about every day when they get out of sleep, every now and they go to bed is how to feed their children. And imagine with all the wonders of life that we have around us to be denied of those opportunities only by the sheer fate of where they were born and when they were born. So they like the luxury of foresight. Each day for a smallholder farmer is a challenge. So assessing the consequences of today's actions on the future generation is a lower priority. So if a family needs to go out, cut a bush, even a tree, to get firewood, to make sure the food is prepared for the children for weeks to come, they don't blink an eye. If a farmer is pushed out of the limits of the land they cultivate, and yet the forest next door, and you know, next, next to their farm is available, this government is not controlling it, going up the slope and bringing land to cultivation is a routine operation. How many places in the world have you gone where 60% slope is just a normal farm anymore? In my own life, Places where I had gone, the bushes that we used to go for, into for adventure are now farms. The forest I grew up with in my neighborhood, in my community, they're long gone. And so the devastation and the footprints of current management of land, water, forests, biodiversity by the smallholder farmers of the world today are clear and very frightening. So the life of most smallholder farmers in other words, has been and continues to be, for the most part, devoid of science. And then there are imminent challenges coming, the so-called grand challenges that I will try to touch this evening. Issues of climate change, and the water, the looming water crisis around the world, the energy demand, and the complexities of uh, availability of land and international trade and all of these issues are pressing upon them. And even if we only take issues of climate or weather variations, that in general and for the normal way of life that these people have had, there is sufficient resilience built in the character and way of life of smallholder farmers. But imagine these people that are barely fending off today in what they know in the lifestyle they lead without any contributions from science, with all the advancement that we have made in science. And now with this imminent change of climate change and so on, how would these societies bear the burden that would coming upon us and upon them in particular. So that is the, you know, the, 
the, the responsibility that I think collectively we have is to bring in the power and the value of science in as quickly as possible in building local capacity to make that available so that their fits, their lots are better, but also they become contributing members of society. The recent frequency and severity and, and uh, model predictions, um, uh, they are not commensurate to resource base or policy support available. Threats from the modern day climate change potentially catastrophic for smallholder farmers and indirectly perhaps affecting all of us as well. What does climate change put at risk? A lot of things. Productivity of farms, forests, livestock and fisheries. Many of you visited in Africa would see this a lot and it strikes me more and more anymore. There are so many livestock in Africa. And I, you know, just because the way the culture was, a lot of the livestock are in the hands of nomadic people around the world. The nomads pride themselves in the livestock they hold, and, and yet the government, many of these governments don't even acknowledge the existence of many the nomadic people in terms of response to the needs of the nomads. And so the first time you hear of drought, much of the damage, the burden is felt by nomadic people. Lots of animals dying, lots of people dying. And so in the process, civilization is losing a lot of the biodiversity Laura was talking about. And, and many of these um, cattle are indigenous cattle with a lot of resistance and adaptation to the local situation. And so with climate change or repeated severity of this weather changes, that's the damage. And the other one is water. Um, I think, you know, Stuart, you did address this, but one of the things that we, we really have not fully realized is how much how low the value of water is in the minds of people around the world, and how much at risk our civilization and society is as a result of the diminishing water. And, and the fact that much of the water of the world is used by communities and societies that have advanced their agriculture. 70% of the fresh water use is in agriculture. And and the same is the case with energy. More of the people that have advanced their communities and societies, science that come into are the ones that are using these resources. At least energy, somehow, technologies and so on would help. But with water and with lack of control and pricing and, and some management there, I think agriculture in particular and society at large is going to be in danger as a result of this challenge we face through, from uh, uh, water. Uh, energy, uh, changing geography of diseases. Diseases that are not common in a particular place may be prominent and important as weather changes. Damages from floods, drought, losses from sea level. Um, and I think in general, these imminent challenges bring smallholder farmers to a huge risk and through them, human civilization would be, as a result, if nothing else, loss of these essential resources such as biodiversity and water resources and things like that. Urgent needs of smallholder farmers, um, access to land, water, and capital, access to reliable markets, access to road and transport, strong but disciplined rural organization, I think, uh, um, the, the idea of the importance of uh, cooperatives and organizations, how valuable they are, but, but these organizations need to be, have real resolve and commitment and discipline to serve communities, because if they do, and then it provides voice to farmers, not only in markets, but in policy decisions and things like that. So, and then um, governments acknowledge smallholder farmers as crucial, their crucial role to society and provide that with sustained support. 
Irrigation, uh, I think I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, we may be out of time. So water is a little, a little used natural resource in African agriculture, but we, we talk about agriculture in general. Uh, one, one thing that I want to mention clearly is the value of water in agriculture is so undervalued in two senses. One, in the fact that it's abused and misused. And secondly, you can be a bad farmer, and if you have good water, you can make it. But without water, it, it requires a lot more sophistication and science to make it. And so it's, it's, water is an underrated resource in, in, in agriculture. Uh, and so for smallholder farmers to make it, if they have water resources, then they could get into sustainable intensification, high value crop farming, mixed farming, and all of the good things that we know would help. And I think this is my final slide. Uh, the resilience of smallholder farmers. Um, with population growth and extreme weather, the resilience of smallholder farmers and sustainability of their ecologies, that is going to be much greater with modern science without it. I make this statement because very often, particularly uh, with well-meaning uh, young men and women, and there is a tendency to think that if we, we need to leave these traditional societies alone. Their, their culture is so rich, and their way of life is so rich, I think they could do well. I, I, and again, with that authority of having been poor and hungry once, I like to think that I think humanity would be much better off with science than without it. Uh, thank you very much. So as the, the panelists come up, um, we, are <clears throat> we are running short on time this afternoon. So um, I believe I get the honor of asking the question that might tie these things together. And then um, if, I can, if I can possibly do that. And then um, hopefully um, you will have some time to visit with our panelists um, after, um, after the session. And I've noticed that I get the distinction of becoming an even more prominent professor. Oh, wait. Um, so, as I listened to the talks, um, I was, I was think, trying to think um, about a question that might um, be able to tie everything together. And because I'm a disease ecologist, it's very hard for me to um, get my head out of, that, um, out of that world. But I think that um, perhaps my world of disease ecology might, might bring us all together. In disease ecology, there is a concept called the dilution effect. And the dilution effect is, um, the more you decrease biodiversity, um, the more you increase the emergence of disease. Uh, because, of, but because biodiversity, whether you're talking about plant diversity or animal diversity, dilutes pathogens across populations. And so as I was listening, whether we're talking about, um, certainly we need resources like water and we need to enrich soil. Um, but I was wondering if each of you could, might consider um, how we could strike a balance between um, processes where we might bring in single crops, single staple crops, um, versus the diversified um, type of model that Dr. Yoder um, was discussing. How do we strike a balance between the two? Because we certainly need to address um, hunger and crop failures and very small areas to farm. But how do we strike a balance between providing this diversity that maybe would protect people beyond just hunger, but even in, in talking about diseases, um, and then with all of the resource needs that people have um, and all of the different contexts that you each represent. Too big of a question? Too broad? Any thoughts? Well, in dealing with the, the, the argument between monocropping and some of your more traditional mixed crop systems, you know, it, it has, has some valid points. I mean, all of our machinery is developed for we're dealing with monocropping systems, but we're finding that in, in, in integrated pest management systems where if you plant your plants in small patches that the pests don't have a chance to really develop a critical population there or they're missing certain phases of their development, 
Um, and so you actually do have less pest problems when you, when you mix crops um, versus monocropping systems. Even to the point of doing strips of different crops to reduce that, that level of, of infection. Um, we all know about the potato famine that hit Ireland. Those problems, as well as a huge pest problem with taro in, in Southeast Asia, came from the, a planting system that was set up to do a monocropping where the leaves touched each other and pathogens were able to pass from plant to plant. And it literally wiped out the potato crop as it did to the taro crop in Southeast Asia in certain places. And it was because of that monocropping which gave a critical mass to these diseases. So if that's what you're talking about of, of, of diversity versus monocropping systems and the ability of, of, of breaking cycles of, of disease, these are some of the ways in which the traditional systems are much richer and much more healthy than the monocropping system. Maybe I could expand my question too to think about water. Is there, um, is there any evidence that um, these bi more diverse types of cropping systems um, are more protective of water and protect, certainly we could talk about soil as well, um, but it, does it help with retention of water or would it help in water um, poor areas to um, maybe move away from the staple crops towards a more diversified type of, of cropping? Yeah, in, t in two ways really. I mean, one way is that um, uh, there are definitely uh, more uh, drought resistant crops than, than other crops. So um, when you do have, you know, uh, it was very clear in all of our talks uh, that <clears throat> um, these small farmers can be living on a knife's edge relative to, um, uh, let's say a drought does come along, uh, it can wipe out their entire crop. Well, there are uh, definitely crops that can uh, survive the, um, the droughts better. But it's, the second way in which really it's kind of more nuanced there is that um, uh, that's not always a food crop. It can also be crops that have other economic values. And so you can actually diverse, I mean, you can actually relative to, to um, the diversification of your crops, you, and how that relates to water, you can actually diversify also the economies around that agriculture. So in other words, if, if a certain crop does fail, and let's say it's a food crop that does fail due to drought, if there are other crops that have other economic value that they can uh, bring to market, even local markets, um, you, they can then turn around and actually buy the food that, that that's, um, they can import. and. Uh, and quite often, like in Haiti, it's an, it's an amazing country in terms of the amount of diversity across a small little country like that relative to the, the climate zones. And so you may have a, a, cat, a catastrophic drought in one area, yet there's plenty of food somewhere else. And so um, I think the diversification helps both um, water drought resistance and um, economic collapse resistance as well. I'd like to um, add to that just a little bit. There are so many ways to diversify. So it could be economic strategies. Um, diversity comes in multiple forms. And one of the things that if uh, you're working in mountainous areas and you were to ask farmers, why are you planting in this way? Uh, why are you planting things intercropped? And also, why do you have fields in all these different locations? It would come down to security that if something doesn't work here, this will work. If this doesn't work, this will work. So you'll find a patchwork quilt kind of um, pattern that people will be planting tree crops in this area, different uh, species in this area, different species in this area, and something will, something will work. There's also a very high awareness of the variability from year to year. So this would be that maybe this year they would have a surplus and be able to sell. Next year, they may be selling something else, but buying something else. So this is where um, looking at the seed systems and exchange systems in a wider uh, capacity is helpful to understand the different strategies people have for food security. 
it's different from year to year, and there's a high uh, tolerance for the variability, but the relationships are important in there. I don't have much to add. Uh, only the fact that perhaps, you know, uh, many of the smallholder farmers of the world traditionally had diversity, diversification, and over time, the challenges that are around them is, is what change their positions. And so getting those policies and strategies right to make sure that it's conducive in encouraging the sustainability of natural resources is, is what, what is needed. And so in general, as policies go all over the world, I think um, policies favor productivity and not necessarily uh, resource conservation long term. And when it does happen and still there is more emphasis for certain crops, certain commodities, and so on. But in the long run, it's it just not a very supportive of overall conservation of and sustainability of resources. We need to be a lot more sensitive in our policy making. I might just add that a research done by the Iowa State University recently came out with showing an organic system, and I talked about that earlier, but the ability of the land to recover is, I think, much greater than we've ever really realized. Um, if, if the land is allowed to take advantage of the, of the systems that God put in place <laughs> instead of fighting against those systems. Um, we're finding that just putting a cover crop on, on our land in, in South Africa is reducing soil surface temperatures by as much as 20 degrees. And of course, that, that, that helps the mycorrhizobias, the bacteria, everything that's growing into the part of the system that's, that's designed to help it survive. And then, you know, the studies are consistent. Rodale's done them, Iowa State's done them, other places have done them, saying that these systems not are economically equal to the more high-tech system, but when a drought year comes by, they far exceed the, the more traditional Western systems. And so that's a sign that, that it's good for water retention, it's good for soil building and structure, and you know the, the soils we got inherited in South Africa were less than a quarter of a percent active carbon. Indications you need at least 1% active carbon to even make chemical fertilizers functional. And so we're, we're finding that, that working with the systems, and for us, as Christians, it's a creation care issue as well. It's not just an economic issue, it's a creation care um, issue of, of saying, God's put in place the systems that we need. Let's look at those and let's use those. And let's not teach our bad habits to somebody else, but let's, let's use the, the science and the research and our ability to verify some of these anecdotal stories that we're getting and, and use that to build long-term sustainability. We have a few more minutes, and I do I see somebody at a microphone? I see one person, and I know her, so I think she might ask a short question. She's safe, you're safe. She might question. ask a short question, right? Because we only have like two minutes. So. Hint, hint. Okay. <laughs> well, this is kind of a loaded question, so um, That's not <laughs> yeah. Um, but each of you kind of talked, uh, touched on stewardship and biodiversity, and also. Um, just preparing for future generations and how feasible that is. And I'm wondering if any of you are involved in community-based conservation efforts and maybe less traditional, um, well, that's a loaded word, but other ways of ensuring that um, there'll be food security for future generations. Um, one thing specifically that I think at least um, Professor Yoder um, has participated in would be like forest restoration or other ways to um, ensure like long-term food security outside of traditional agriculture, or what we think of in the West as agriculture. Oh, I can answer first. <laughs> um, yeah, so in, in areas, uh, other work in very fragile environments in desert areas of the island of Timor, one of the things that I'm interested in is the institutional mechanisms that people have in place to divide 
and share resources. So around forests, and um, one of the things that interests me there is how many conservation areas people have in place, what they use them for, and the conservation benefits of setting aside forests for different kinds of use, um, but then the downstream positive effects that they would have for water, shade, and uh, creating small forest islands in the middle of the desert that can be sources of um, crops and other kinds of uh, species and foods in a place where it's very hard to grow annual crops. Okay, well, I think that um, to keep the symposium moving on time, that I think that we'll have to have that be the last word. And thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us today.